Welcome to a walk in the park, a retreat from the ordinary. I'm Lisa Clayton, Parks Director for the City of Franklin. Each show will provide you information regarding park projects, special events, and interesting topics about Franklin Parks. We have a big show for you today. Our Parks and Grounds and Landscaping foreman, Brian Walker, will tell us about his big plans they have for Eastern Flank property and a recent facelift of some of our oldest cemeteries and more. Then, our Parks Facility Superintendent, Kevin Lindsay, continues his tour of Harlandsdale Farm property with the man who grew up there, Mr. Jim Hayes. This will give you a glimpse into the old barn that sits behind the Hayes home. Joining me now, Brian Walker, Parks Grounds and Landscaping Foreman for the City of Franklin Parks Department. Brian, thank you for being well. here. Uh, many of our citizens may not know that you've been with the city for several years, but what is your job? What do you do on a daily basis and uh, some of the projects that you've done? Well, in a nutshell, uh, if it's green and growing in the parks, I take care of it and, and my crews help take care of that. So uh, that's basically what, what we look at doing. Part of, uh, part of my background, uh, I've, I've been here in Franklin for 13 years, I'm sorry, excuse me, 17 years. I've been working with the parks uh, for seven of those years. Uh, my wife uh, and I and our, and our children have really grown to love Franklin. I grew up just north of here in Franklin and uh, in Nashville, and that's where I really developed my interest in uh, horticulture. And from there, I went to the uh, University of Tennessee, and I received my bachelor's degree in ornamental horticulture and landscape design. And uh, with that uh, uh, degree, I've really been able to, I think, utilize it a lot here in the park system. Uh, you know, some of the projects we've done within the park system that I enjoy the most uh, is we, we created a, a large berm over in Jim Warren. It took about 300 acres, or excuse me, 300 yards of topsoil uh, to develop that in, with a mix of uh, um, deciduous and uh, evergreen trees, uh, uh, plants and uh, boulders and, and, and seasonal color that we mix into there. Another area that I'm, I'm proud of is the uh, event space that we created at Harlandsdale. Uh, it, it was previously a, a corral for, for the horses, uh, we, and it was pretty rough and, and, and difficult to, to, uh, to use. Uh, but we were able to go in there, smooth that area out, grade it out, install irrigation, uh, and now it's a, it's a two acre site where uh, a lot of events can take place throughout the year and people can just simply come out and enjoy the space as an open grassy area. Uh, and finally, one of the projects, and it's really an ongoing project that we do, is uh, working with uh, the City Arborist and the Tree Commission. And in the last five years, we've planted approximately 1,400 trees uh, that uh, uh, have, have been doing very well. And in that, I, can, I hope to, that that project will continue uh, in the years to come. Absolutely. And, and you know how important that is to our community. Quality of life is just ranges from a broad range within our community and and that's so much part of it um eastern flank i'm going to kind of switch gears and go over there and we're soon going to talk about trees but uh, of the grove that'll be going in but the master plan was completed in 2008 mm -hmm. and so we just opened a new road yes. um, but y'all your divisions have so much to do with the existing landscape so if a visitor came out today what would they see in, in with the new entrance as well as um, when they enter the park? Well, it, obviously the road is the dominant new feature in the area. Uh, it, it's really, from a maintenance st standpoint, that has really uh, flipped that property around. Uh, it used to be you'd come in off of Carton Lane and then the, the road frontage along Lewisburg Pike was kind of the back of the property. Well, now that's that's the front of the property. It's the, it's the entryway and the exit. You know, the road comes in, it's a large horseshoe. Uh, so it, it's a really a dramatic feature in the park. Uh, along with the park, there are several pull-offs to where if, if people don't want to walk from the parking lots, uh, they can pull use those side pull-offs and then they can explore other areas of the park that uh, they wouldn't necessarily been able to access easily. Uh, and again, another aspect are the, the par uh, parking lots themselves. Uh, there are some new parking lots. Uh, those are uh, in front of the Fleming Center, uh, which, which makes it a much easier access point there. But also, if people are familiar with the, uh, the old park, uh, the way it was, uh, some of the uh, larger parking lots have been removed. Uh, and it, it, it gets, a, I think, a, a cleaner flow through the park system. Uh, some other new things is uh, the contractors who are doing the work out there. They, they've been installing some very uh, mature uh, native tree species. So it's exciting to see that the, uh, the park is being developed. Absolutely, and, and what a great, it, it's been an adventure for us in the Parks Department, I know, mm -hmm. since the inception of uh, taking the old golf course, returning it to a battlefield kind of thing. And But 
with the master plan, there were a lot of different um, elements within it, mm -hmm. um, from new trail systems, because with the old golf course and what you see on the site right now is a lot of the cart paths. And Correct. it's what most people will relate them to because it's the concrete. But we're going to redo, I know you've been in, um, redo those cart paths, and mm -hmm. I know you've been in contact with Eric Jacobson from the Executive Director at Carton, as well as Thomas Flagel, who sits on our mm -hmm. Battlefield Preservation Commission. Share kind of those ideas of what's to come within the next few years, because a lot of people think this is going to happen within a, a year's time, but it, there's a long process with this. Correct. Yeah, it certainly is. is it'll be a, a multi-year process. Uh, part of w w when we had those conversations with those folks a few weeks ago, it is we're designing the, uh, we're trying to create a, a new trail system. When the road went in, it, it, it bisected several of the existing trailways. And what we want to try and be able to do is, is to recreate and connect the, the existing trail system that's there. Uh, and then also, the overall effect what we're wanting to do is uh, create a meadow uh, space in, in that area, uh, something that would be reminiscent of, of the time frame that we're trying to represent, which is 18, uh, 1860 to 1865, to where people, when they come in, they get an idea of what the property as a whole looked like during that, uh, during that time. Uh, another area we're wanting to create is an overlook. It's, a, it's, an, it's a, one of the higher points in the park where if people aren't able to walk out to, to the longer distances, uh, they can come up and they'll be able to view and, and see those different view sheds that, that are available to them. Um, and then lastly, as far as the uh, going back to the trails, uh, the new trails is right now uh, we have uh, existing concrete cart paths that are there. And what we want to be doing is, is to slowly uh, transform those back into a more, more natural uh, gravel pathway that's accessible to, to everyone. And probably one of the things that most people will recognize is if they've ever been to um, Stony River over in Murfreesboro, they have basically the gravel pathways that kind of guide you through that. Um, and we've had a lot from the nonprofit organizations with Battle of Franklin Trust and mm -hmm. uh, Franklin's Charge. We've received grants. They have, and they've been so gracious that that's where the interpretive signage is going to be upon those new pathways. Yeah, and that interpretive signage is going to be real important. Uh, it, it's going to tell about you know not only uh, Carton uh, as it was bef previous before the battle. It'll talk about trail movement or excuse me, soldier movement uh, through the property, and then even some of the aftermath of of, of how the, the plantation. Uh, how it grew and how it was able to continue after the, after the war. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned trees earlier in mm -hmm. the conversation. Yes. Is something exciting that will be returned to the property is an apple orchard. Uh, kind of explain a little bit to our audience what that will entail and what they'll see uh, for years to come. Well, historically there was an apple orchard on the on the plantation uh, and the expectations is uh, again working through the city arborist and the contractors uh, that, that, that those trees should be planted sometime this fall and, and actually within the next few weeks is when those should be going into the ground. And where they're going to be located is uh, along the existing cemetery. They'll be running parallel with that cemetery uh, and we believe it'll be two to three rows uh, that will straddle uh, the, the, uh, the roadway as it passes through. So in the future as visitors come through they'll, they'll literally be driving through the apple orchard oh and what a great what a great view shed that'll be yes. especially with the the private cemetery that's there um, such a great story the eastern flank facility we have it for rent and I know we've done a lot of work in-house as far as the department's concerned with redoing the full inside we basically have gutted it and it's open for corporate parties mm -hmm. Christmas parties I want to kind of bring that out is for rent uh, at this time of year that's yes. coming up but one of the things that the Heritage Ball is currently housed out there but we also see a lot of private events that will mm -hmm. be coming in the future What's kind of the plans for the event space that's surrounding? Um, of course, you have the battlefield when you walk out the back, but I know that you've been kind of working with your team to develop a, an event space. What does that entail? Correct. You know, part of it was, was real important uh, to, to all the groups uh, that are that are a part of this property is to, is to blend the the historical aspects with some of the modern features that are there and that, and that was real important because we, even though we have different organizations that own different pieces of property we wanted when a visitor comes to the park is for it to be a, a seamless transition to where there is no this is this is one group here and another group here we want it to, to blend together very nicely and that's where the landscape can, co can come in if we have a visitor that comes from the Fleming Center and they begin their tour uh, walking along the new uh, paths that we're going to be installing we, we don't want them 
them to necessarily be able to see the event space that's there. So through the use of landscape, with through native trees, uh, some maybe some uh, larger shrubs, that we can help screen and create uh, areas that will block that off. And, and, and unless they want to come down to that area, then they can come down and, and see that. Uh, and then we're also in the process of developing, a, a, in addition to the indoor event space, an outdoor event space. And the idea with that is to incorporate some of the historical features as of the McGavick's Grove. Uh, Right now, through the historians, they don't know the exact location of where that was, but, but through the use of, of, of tree planting, we'll try and interpret that as, as best we can. Absolutely. What a great space that will be for future, um, for our residents to use in the future and that type of thing. Well, I'm going to kind of switch gears on you because okay. you, you're pretty much your scope over all the cities, not just your parts, but you've inherited the city cemeteries, oh, yes. the historic cemeteries. He has Rest Haven and the city cemetery. Share with the audience what your view is and from a maintenance standpoint and then restoring those for our community. Well, one, one thing that's real important with the, the historical cemeteries is we want to be able to obviously respect the f people who are, who are buried there and respect them by, by being able to tell their stories. Uh, and in order to tell their stories, we want to have a space that is uh, um, inviting for people to come by and, and look. Uh, genealogists, you know, potential family members, uh, Civil War buffs, you know, there's a, there's a, a wide range of, of, of people who are uh, buried there from re uh, Revolutionary War through the Civil War even, uh, even later. So it, it's important that we develop a, uh, a, a, an attractive, uh, inviting place to where people can come out and, and, and experience that. Absolutely, and with the road construction that's taking place, we'll actually incorporate some parking, and mm -hmm. so that's a that'll be a, a great new addition. Now, a, a couple of months ago, there was a workshop held at the city cemeteries, um, to where with the Heritage Foundation and incorporate. Share with the audience what took place there and, and how we're going to incorporate that. Well, that, that was a, a great two-day event. Uh, we had several members of, of the Parks Department plus uh, members from the community come out. They, uh, we, we, the instructor was a master stonemason, and, and, and one thing that I took away from him that he said many times was respecting the original stonemason's intent. Uh, th those walls are almost 100 years old now. They've gone through many events from flooding to tree damage to, uh, to vehicle damage, and we were, for the event of the, uh, of the training class that we had, it was, a, it was repairing uh, some damage to where the wall just simply, due to its age, collapsed in on itself. Uh, and so we were able to take, uh, we used about two and a half tons of, of new stone in combination with the existing stone, and we were able to, to make a repair that, you know, hopefully will be there for another hundred years. Uh, so it, it was really exciting, you know, just the different tools and the techniques. And one thing also I take away from it is, it's not just a matter of uh, grabbing a rock and putting it in place. It, it, there's an artwork and an art form to that, uh, which made it uh, uh, very, very enjoyable to learn. Absolutely, and I know that many of our people that actually went through it of our staff, they did enjoy it. And uh, like you said, it's such a respectful place and we want to do the best that we can and I know that you and your divisions will do that. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with our audience yourself as well as uh, what you do within the Parks Department. Coming up, a rare look inside one of the city's oldest barns. Don't go away. Good morning, Franklin. It's another beautiful day in the neighborhood. Local news is coming up next. We'll check the weather and the traffic. You have a great day.
say good evening, Franklin, Tennessee. In the previous episode of Walk in the Park, Kevin Lindsay, our facility superintendent, took a tour of the historic Hayes home with the man who grew up there. Today, Kevin meets up with Mr. Hayes again for a tour of the old barn right behind the house. Let's take a walk back in time. All right, Mr. Hayes, we are up at the barn now. As you can see, the house is directly behind us. That's right. So we're actually traveling north now up to the Hayes barn. Right. This uh, barn uh, was built, we believe, around 1937, 19, in that era. And it was the first complete building that was built on the place here. Wow. It sort of acted as a, uh, I guess you'd call it a marshalling yard for all the other construction that they were doing. And actually they did construction probably about five years before they got the place like they wanted it. And this would have all taken place uh, Right around prior to World War One, World War, World War Two, uh, I think it all sort of ended when World War Two, all the expansion did at that time. Let's so, go in. So after we got through renovating the house, they come up here. They built this 37, 38-ish. I think it was all going on about the same time. So maybe, maybe there about around 1940-ish. Maybe it's complete. Maybe yeah. a little bit sooner. Yeah. And then uh, the other guys got started on the main barn down there because right. that was completed somewhere there right. about 42. Right. So great. That's some good timeline. Right. Let's go, go watch in. Watch step and let's go, go on in here. See, most of this is still original. This was a corn crib, and the purpose for the space between the slats is to enable the corn to breathe when it's been uh, stored in the crib. It would be pulled, unlike they do today, they shell corn in the field. In uh, the days when corn was raised here, it was harvested on the cop. And it was done that way for two reasons. One is that uh, uh, many old-time horse people believed that feeding horses corn on the cob was healthier for them. But another good reason is we ground cob and corn and all up into one feed mixture for sort of bulk. So you might say, well, you got the cereal, the corn, and the bulk fiber of the cob. So we, we had our own uh, feed mill in the old powerhouse building and we made all of our feed products here on the farm. So uh, wasn't a whole lot we couldn't do when we were running full steam. All right That's, now the Parks Department all we're doing with this building is basically just housing one or two of our tractors in sure. it and we're using it for hay storage because as I mentioned earlier it is the driest barn on the property until we had uh, the main barn, or what we call the, uh, you know, the show barn, uh, re-roofed. So, well, this this barn, and and the camera is panning now to give you a, a view of the barn, but this barn was uh, built primarily for cattle, and uh, then it was modified later as a dual-use horse cattle barn, and you can tell that by looking at the doors on the stalls. The doors uh, have two halves to them, a lower half and an upper half. Let's and when I it was can't. being used for cattle, you only closed the lower door. That was the only one that was necessary to be closed. But if you're going to uh, contain a horse who's pretty nosy and has a long neck, you would have the option to close both doors. And that would give you a little bit more secure stall area for a horse. But it's not a, the barn is not that big. If you look carefully, you'll see it, it, it only has a total of eight stalls, but they're very roomy. And uh, they lead back into side sheds where cattle could be kept uh, in groups. And there's an alleyway leading back, uh, connecting the shed to the main hall of the barn. So when the cattle were being moved, you could move them easily from uh, from one place to another. Is that this uh, little area here you're talking mm -hmm. about? We've got some 
busted bale here. That's just a, a, a haul way for cows. It's just a raceway. It's a little raceway. And you also see it serves as a as a, a pinch chute. Now, probably very few of your viewers know what a pinch chute is. But when you're doctoring an animal, you have to confine the animal so the animal does not hurt itself or hurt you. And the, and the chute uh, is actually two raceways in parallel. One was to confine the animal uh, so the animal would be somewhat immobile. And the other is to protect you and you would administer the vaccines or whatever you were doing over the safety of the fence. So it's pretty well thought out. And this was the day before all of these appliances were available at the co-op uh, as units. You know, you can now buy a head catch unit separately. You can even buy one to mount in a barn. But in the days when this barn was built, you built all your own. You might, you're standing in front of something but wondering why on earth is that tire rim there? Would you like to hand, like to have sure. the gas? What would that be for? Well, that's for the storage of water hose. So you have an old tire rim, you didn't throw it away, you nailed it up in the barn, and then when you, uh, of course, when you watered the animals, you got to, had to do that with a hose every day, twice a day, and you would be sure the water was lifting the just, hose to freeze. Just take that hose and just right. wrap it like that. Wrap it right around there. And uh, yeah, people go down to Walgreens now and pay $29.95 right. for a piece of plastic to hang on the wall. And, and nowadays, uh, you know, it, we, we sort of had to do with what we had back in those those days. But uh, as I've told you very often, Gavin, this is the best built barn on the property. I would have to agree. It's, it it's sure. made out of tremendous timber. And uh, if you can look up and see the quality of the lumber that's, that's built, uh, it's just unbelievable. Look, look at those not free uh, two by tens that are up there in two by, two by eights. A single knot in any of that wood. What I think is interesting on this barn is it's got a big overhang on it right here on this front part. Well, all this was part of the haying system. And uh, if you look at that big overhang, and you probably get dizzy looking up there. Uh, you'll see there's a rail system. And the, the rail system ends about here. And on that rail system would be a trolley and a rope and a hay hook which would come down and address the load of loose hay. It had four prongs like an octopus. And as you put upward lift on the rope, the hooks would close like a clamshell. Now would that be off of a trailer or would y'all just bring the hay yep, up no, and just dump the hay? No, it'd be off of a trailer or a wagon. Trailer. And typically a load of hay would require about eight different hook settings to move it all into the loft. Now, as soon as power was applied to the pull rope, which was in the back of the barn, the load would go vertical, the big clump of hay in the clamshell, and as soon as it hit the horizontal rail, it would convert its motion to horizontal. And it would ride that rail in the barn, and it, tra and it would be trailing a rope that the workman in the barn on the stack of hay would grab, and they would jerk that rope, and unload that hay where they wanted it. Then you would pull all that mechanism back by hand and reset it and redo it again. Meanwhile, the power was the mules or the horses on the other side Generally of the barn. Generally a team of horses. Team of horses running the rope up to the top, which would connect everything together. Right. Which it was back a very complicated pulley system. The rope went to the horses, up through the horizontal rail, through the trolley, down to the hook. Wow. It was a, called a hay crane by uh, northerners and a uh, hay hook in the south. And uh, we, we pretty well harvested most of our hay that way. The big uh, negative was that hay, when it's harvested in the field, is juicy and green. Maintains a lot of moisture, no matter how, mo how much you cure it. So you had a hazard that if you took green hay into your barn, and uh, did not ventilate it, you had the possibility of uh, spontaneous combustion setting your barn on fire. So to alleviate that hazard, to prevent it, we, we constructed a big ventilation system, just like the 
just like the uh, ductwork of your house, except it was giant. A man could walk through it. And on the end of that was a huge fan with a big propeller about the size of a Cessna airplane propeller and a huge electric engine. And you would ventilate the air through that hay to keep it from overheating and burning the barn down. Wow. You do that for about three weeks. Now, was that common knowledge back during this time? Or state is that, of the art. That was state of the art, probably first one in the county. No, nah, you know, it was like among that. the first. Among the first. Right. And uh, we didn't use that system too long because of, uh, a functional economical baler came along about the same time. And once we had uh, balers available, we baled the hay, let it cure in the field as long as necessary, and then haul it to the barn. From the Parks Department, I'll send it back to you, Lisa. Thank you, Kevin, for another fascinating tour. Also, a special thanks to Brian Walker, Parks and Grounds Landscaping Foreman. And to you, we love providing you with information about the best parks in Franklin. Visit us anytime at our website for upcoming events at franklintn.gov. I'm your host, Lisa Clayton, and remember, take a walk in the park. See you next time. Thank you.